The trial against Trezell and Jacqueline West, who are the adoptive parents of Classic and Sincere, has been underway. And in today's video, we're going to talk about some of the highlights and get caught up on what's been going on with it. Hello Sofa Squad and welcome back to the sofa which is right behind me with Mr. Roscoe P. Coltrane and my name is Paul. Now as I said in my little intro today what we're going to be doing is going over the case against Trezell and Jacqueline West. Now to go ahead and clear everything up, uh, Classic and Sincere are the two little boys that they adopted. They changed their names to Orrin and Orson West. Now, when we go and review these articles and things of that nature, the boys are referred to as Orin and Orson. But like, as you see in like my title, stuff like that, I try to uh, refer to them as classic and sincere. But when I'm reading the articles and whatnot, uh, I'm not going to try and sit here and change it every time I go over it. Because if you follow me, you know that'll get me all befuddled. So just know that when we talk about Orin and Orson, we are talking essentially about uh, classic and sincere. Okay, so that being said, this trial has been going on. I think it's in like day 20 at this point. Now, if you've been following me, you know we've been like deep into Lori Datebell, Letitia, but I've been watching this in the background, or I shouldn't say that. I should say uh, reading articles, stuff like that. The judge has this on a lockdown, right? And so now he has made it to where you can do audio, but I've heard of other YouTubers getting in trouble for using it and that kind of thing. So what we're going to do for this video is we are going to be reviewing articles, tweets, that kind of thing uh, and just go over some of those highlights like I said, we'll kind of do like a, a, a intro overview and then talk about the most recent things because as of this recording, I'm recording this on uh, May 10th. It is Wednesday. Uh, the prosecution has rested. The defense has done their opening statements and are starting their case. So this is going to kind of be where we pick up uh, and that's it. So let's go ahead and jump on in to the first article. Now, like I said, what I want to do is just do a quick intro and we're going to do it through some of these uh, quick snippets from court tv uh, and as you see at the bottom the brothers classic and sincere were three and four when they were reported missing from their california city home on december 21st 2020 by jacqueline and Trizel. now they also have two or they had two biological children and two other adopted children they were all under the age of 10 and under the roof at the time now as you see here here's a picture of the two little boys uh and we'll just read through this real quick so as this time passed, tips poured in, search parties were formed, uh, billboards, news houses. If you follow this, you know, I mean, this was major, right? Everyone was looking for these boys. Now, it says that the West were taken into custody on March 1st, 2022. Now, it says after the investigation and all that kind of stuff, evidence pointed to uh, Orrin and Orson, remember, classic and sincere, having died in September 2020, three months before they were reported missing. It says charges against the West include second degree M, involuntary manslaughter, and willful cruelty to a child, among other accounts. Now, the quick 60 second, not even that 30 second story of what they were saying happened. Trezell West told police he was collecting firewood in December 2020 from a field adjacent to his California city home, while Orna Orson drew a chalk on a concrete slab in the backyard. Trezell said he returned from collecting wood, went inside the house to check on the fireplace, and went back outside to see the kids were gone. Essentially, they disappeared into thin air, and this kicked off everything. Uh, and then very quickly, I just have a couple of pictures, this little snapshot of um, Jacqueline in court, and this is a Trezell there kind of hiding behind the computer there. Uh, and so that's it. Okay, so that's the, again, 60 second version of what happened. I've got, and this will probably be attached to the playlist. Uh, there's videos that I did when this, when we followed this very closely when this first came out. If you want to go more into deep dive, this is a new case to you, uh, but that's not going to be the purpose of this um, video. video. This video's purpose is to go over some of the updates from court um and so there's that now what i want to do is because basically what i'm doing here and oftentimes especially if you're familiar here you'll just know that i'll kind of just like peruse things and gather all the information up i can find so that being said you know i'm not a professional lawyer attorney cop doctor journalist any of this stuff right all this information is readily available on the internet for anybody i've just kind of gathered it up and we're talking about what i consider the highlights Okay, the first thing I'm putting up here is this article, um, and it is 
citing basically going down all the list of the family testimony which for me really brought things home as to like what's being said out there because these were the people i was very curious to hear from so we're just going to start up at the top i'm going to make some commentary along the way so it says evidence presented in this case has revolved around september to december 2020. smith has called upon the west family members to provide their accounts about orrin and orson jurors must also decide for themselves the credibility of each person and here's what they had to say so wanda west now I was dying to hear like what she had to say, right? Okay, so the mother of Trezell West said she hadn't seen Orrin and Orson since February of 2020. She was told that they were at the house of their maternal grandmother, Maria Martinez, which wasn't unusual, Wanda testified. The grandmother said she couldn't care for the two toddlers who cried often while also focusing on the West for other children. The West have six children total. Martinez, the mother of Jacqueline West, testified her daughter, daughter only came to visit her once after moving to California City, and it was in December 2020, which contradicts previous testimony by Wanda West, saying she thought Orrin and Orson were with Martinez when Wanda came to visit the West in the California City home in September 2020. Josiah West, the brother of Trezell, said he hadn't seen the boys after they moved to California City. Philip West, the father of Trezell, said after Trezell and Jacqueline moved to California City, he never saw Orrin and Orson. So let's pause there for a second. So here's my thing with this, is you, you hear this, everyone's got a different story. This inner circle all has a different story that revolves around when these boys were seen and when they weren't. There is confusion, but a consistent thing is when they moved out there, it's like, they were ghosting people. They just weren't. Now, mind you, it's a little bit of a drive. I'll give them that. But, like, everyone has the same thing. Like, well, I only saw them once. We didn't see them. And it never saw the boys. Da, da, da. And this is kind of that timeline that the cops and investigators and all that are saying. Like, look, you know, when they moved out there, it's like, did the, were the boys ever even out there? That was, like, a huge thing when this went down. Okay, let's continue. So, Perla Martinez, the sister of Jacqueline West, says she's never met the children Trizel and Jacqueline West have adopted. There was one occasion in which she was video chatting with Jacqueline and testified seeing a lot of little heads, but she also testified that she's never met the kids and therefore doesn't recognize their faces. The 12-year-old boy testified several times he didn't remember answers to Smith's questions. However, in a video showing an interview with a forensic interviewer who specializes in questioning children, the preteen said he saw Orrin choking and vomiting. He touched Orrin's body and it was cold, which is how he knew the 4-year-old had passed away, according to the video. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. First of all, how heartbreaking is that for a 12-year-old to have to be up there testifying about this stuff, right? Now, again, with children, all this kind of stuff, and we're going to see with some of the other things that we cover, uh, where there's conflicting testimony and whatnot, but that just seems to be par for the course in this case. And again, when you have children involved, number one, it's heartbreaking, but number two, it can be difficult, right? Uh, because, I mean, just think of how we are with trying to keep things this and that and the other, and they have all these other influences. And especially with this, I cannot imagine being in the same room with uh, Jacqueline and Trezell as one of the children and testifying. That has to be utterly frightening. Okay, we're going to move on to the secondary part of this article. This says, soon after the move to California, the 12-year-old boy said he heard a sound like a soap bottle falling in the bathroom. Before the sound, Orson was around. But after that, the 12-year-old said he never saw Orson again. A 10-year-old son said or Orin and Orson lived with him in California City, but doesn't remember how long both children were there. He also thinks he remembers seeing Orrin sleeping in a bunk bed in California City. This child said he also remembers Orrin and Orson helping him decorate a Christmas tree. A nine-year-old son who didn't recognize pictures of Orrin and Orson West when they were shown to him by Smith. However, he said Orrin and Orson didn't move with them to California City. He also testified he doesn't remember how long Orrin and Orson lived in California City. An eight-year-old son had a conflicting answers. He said he remembered Orrin and Orson moving to California City, but also said he didn't remember the toddlers coming with him. So this is what I'm talking about. This testimony from the children and whatnot, I mean, it's all over the place, right? Now, again, I mean, these are kids, right? This is traumatic. Remember, this wasn't like yesterday that this happened, okay? It's like during, like, the middle of COVID, okay? And again, this is one of those scenarios when this went down, it scared us all to death because, like, how much of this is going on, right? Because everyone kind of slipped under the radar uh, and it just seemed that that's what was going on with this this was like this whole perfect storm coming together of you know them hiding out everyone being sequestered so on and so forth uh, but when you sit here and listen to this you know like the eight-year-old I'm like well what was he like six at the time you know what I'm saying uh, same thing with these other children so I, I don't fault them for this and again 
this, I can't imagine testifying well ever for something like this, right? Uh, but especially it, being a little kid like this and having to recall that, I mean, there's no way. So anyways, let's go to the next thing. Okay, so now let's jump up to kind of like present time type situation. Uh, and let's look at this article you'll see on the screen. It says West trial day 18 prosecution rest and Jacqueline West attorney gives an opening statement. It's by Jason Katowski. Uh, this came out May 8th, <clears throat> pardon me. So let's go on to the first part of that. And Bakersfield, California, KGET. So Trizel and Jacqueline West's eldest child who last week testified to seeing one of the brothers die in 2020 and another disappear days later was in influenced by improper coercive interview techniques that made him susceptible to false memories, a defense attorney said. Let's pause. Now, this is going to be one thing that the defense, I believe, is going to really try and do is just rip all this stuff apart. I mean, that's what they do, right? Um, but this is going to be something where I don't know if I've ever seen a convoluted case like this where there's so many different interfering things and so many... Uh, how's that saying go where like something that the sand slips between your fingers type things and slips between the cracks that type of situation there's so much of this you know and them being able to utilize essentially the children's testimony to kind of revert it around to be like well look I mean they're saying you know various things I hope that you know doesn't not end well okay so let's continue an expert witness who reviewed evidence in the case including multiple interviews will testify the social worker who interviewed the boy engaged in browbeat to make the child then 10 say what she wanted him to say, said attorney Alexia Torres Stallings. She said another witness enhanced surveillance images and footage taken of the West Home and will testify to the methods used and what the enhanced footage reveals. There are no confessions and there's no forensic evidence. All we have is the story of a 10 year old boy, Stallings said. Now, if you follow this when this first went out, one of the neighbors had a camera, thank God. And he had a camera on the thing. I mean, this was huge, right? Because the West were like coming up with a story where it was like, okay, the kids went out here and disappeared into thin air, right? Well, I mean, y'all, with the analyzation that went on on YouTube, y'all, of this video of, but it turned out to be true because it was like, you couldn't see anything back there. And you're having to enhance this and do this and do that. And it's it's murky water, right? But for the most part, I think everyone agreed where, you know, how do these kids disappear into thin air in that amount of time? Something just didn't feel right. Something didn't seem right. At the conclusion of our case, it is still a tragedy, Stallings told the jury. But, she said, the outstanding question of where the boys are will still remain. She said the jury will find the case against the West cannot be proved beyond a reasonable doubt and will acquit both of all charges. Each of the West's four other children, all 10 or younger at the time, told authorities they hadn't seen Orn and Orson for weeks. Trezal West's parents and Jacqueline West's mother said months had gone by without seeing the youngest children. Okay, now let's move on to the next one. Prosecutor Eric Smith has said that both boys died in September 2020 when the West moved from an apartment in Bakersfield to a house in California City. They were reported missing by the West on December 21st, 2020. Trezal West told authorities he was gathering the fire where the boys were playing at while the boys played outside. And he said he briefly went indoors and came back and the boys were gone. Jacqueline West has said she was wrapping Christmas presents inside. A week after the reported disappearance, the eldest boy gave an interview to a social worker in which he said he saw Orrin die in the Bakersfield apartment. He said he heard noises in the night of the room in the room where all the children slept. The next morning, he said Orrin was face down on his mattress and later, when his parents entered the room, he saw the boy had vomited and his color was fading. Now, again, if you followed this from the beginning and if you haven't, we'll talk about it. Um, you know, so they moved from Bakersfield to this California city home and, um, and this is what was just kind of like, you know, why do they do that? You know, the housing was like a lot more affordable out there you know many reasons but then uh, so many people they did all this research and how they got the loan and this and that and you know i mean you know how the internet is right i mean it gets crazy so hearing this though to me i was like oh my god so this is what i'm also trying to think because remember this is like tight-lipped and it always has been and it's so frustrating to me because cases like this were cps because a lot of this was like um hello don't they have people come in to check on the home like how did this even happen you know of, like the kids not being seen for this and that and the whole nine yards so hearing this kind of testimony i was like oh this makes total sense right um because it does seem like and this is you know my opinion this is allegedly this is not fact uh it does seem like they 
there was a little bit of like money making to be made in this, you know, adoption thing they were doing, right? Or like fostering, adopting, all that kind of thing. It just seems like it was maybe a way to make a living. Uh, but again, I didn't know them personally, so I can't say for sure. Uh, but again, hearing this kind of testimony, I'm like, yeah, this is kind of what we all thought. You know, something happened to these boys and some way uh and then the question of did they both or one of them ever even make it out there to california city the eldest child told the social worker he touched Oren and his body was cold now stallings will call dr susan napolitano to the stand to illustrate how the boy's statement was influenced by the social worker she said napolitano will go over the history of forensic interviews and the child abuse hysteria of the 80s where dozens of adults were charged with crimes but later exonerated after after it was shown children fabricated testimony due to suggestive questioning techniques. Kern County holds a prominent place among those cases. Tori Stallings noted of 27 convictions in Kern County from 82 to 85 for involved in alleged molestation rings, 25 were later overturned. Now that statistic at the bottom is shocking and scary, but one thing that we all learn from this is that there's a lot of shady stuff that goes on out there, right? And I'm not trying to just single them out, but you know how these cases are where you kind of like all of a sudden learn about whether it's the family of the victim or perpetrator and the area that they live in and how the legal system works. It just puts this magnifying glass in the whole thing. And um, yeah. There was a lot to be desired. Let's continue. Now we're going to move on to the West Trial Day 19. Eldest child gave conflicting statement to the grand jury, again by uh, Jason Katowski. So it says the eldest child of Trizel and Jacqueline West told Kern County Grand Jury last year that he saw his youngest brother just days before Christmas 2020, contradicting earlier interviews in which he said he hadn't seen the children for weeks before they were reported missing. It wasn't until about 30 minutes into this testimony, after being shown an earlier interview, View with a social worker that the boy told the grand jury he heard his brother Oren Four gagging one night and the next day his parents told him he had died. As questioning, continu as questioning continued, he said he hadn't seen his younger brother Orson Three for a long time before he and Oren were reported missing and he believed Orson had been staying at a grandmother's house. The child's hour-long testimony was read Tuesday morning as a defense counsel for Tr as defense counsel for Trizel and Jacqueline West attempted to show the child then ten was in influenced by improper questioning and his testimony is unreliable. Now here's the thing. I mean, this is again with the children's testimony and all this type of stuff. One thing that is prevalent to me in going through this is just seeing again the conflicting stories and not just I'm trying to say that like uh, you know that I'm agreeing with the defense and this or whatever. Um, but if they are going to be able to kind of twist this around in that way and prove like look yeah you can't really rely on this right that's not going to be good um but also again one thing that is consistent is the inconsistency and in how when how and when anyone saw these children it doesn't seem right i don't understand how all these people are like oh yeah well they moved to california we never saw the kids you know oh well i can't remember when i saw them that's not normal this is your brother adopted or not right you're living under the same roof with this these children you know it's a, this foggy thing where i'm like why don't they remember when they saw him like this is so weird you know what i mean like it, you would think that that's your family member like you see them all the time you know now also for the grandparents and whatnot again that was just it's so strange to be like oh yeah we never really saw him and you know once they left I think that they operated in this confusion, and by they, I mean Trizel and Jacqueline. I think that that's what they were good at. If you look at the, or if you remember back, or if you go and look it up, or if you look at my videos back, the interview that they gave off, which was literally just started this off, right? When they went out and gave this interview, and the natural family to classic and sincere were there, right? Uh, off to the sidelines. They got a little bit of a scruffle because they were like PO'd, right? Jacqueline and Trizel seemed like they had rehearsed this story. It was like, okay, let's begin. And like they spit the story out. It didn't seem right. Their body language was off. You know, but again, at the time it's COVID. Well, maybe that's why they're wearing these huge face masks. They're rocking back and forth. Well, maybe it's because they're, you know, understandably upset. There's many other things, but something didn't feel right. And it still 
doesn't feel right. And I think the only thing that really the defense can rely on is this doubt, right? Of, well, you know, there's this, but if you just look at, you know, from my perspective at least, of, look, children just don't disappear into thin air. Brothers and sisters, it's not normal to say, unless there's some kind of thing where, oh, they stay over at so-and-so's house on the regular, right? If you move somewhere, the whole family goes in this scenario, right? There's no reason why there should be this blurry fogginess about, well, I don't really remember if they were in the new house with us. It just shouldn't be there. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to read over some tweets. These are from KGET 17 News, and I'm going to put them up on the screen, and we're just going to review them together here so you can read along with me. And I'm going to start at the top with this one. Uh, and I'm going to be kind of staring at the screen while I do this, but I'll put it up here in the corner, so just know that's what I'm doing. All right, so... Sonia Barton, who has previously testified, has been called to the stand by Stallings. Remember, this is the defense, uh, one of them. And she's a social worker who interviewed the other West children. Barton had two interviews with the West eldest child on December 22nd, 2020. And Stallings is going to play the second interview. Transcripts are handed out. Video is playing. Barton is asking about discipline in the house. The boy said his father will either give them a tongue lashing or make them sit in the corner. Barton asked about being forced to take cold showers. The boy said he's never had a cold shower as a form of punishment, and he thinks sometimes the showers were turned on cold but just needed to warm up. Barton tells the boy all his other brothers talk about getting the cold showers. The boy says Orin and Orson took cold showers too. Now, let's go on to the second one. So, the boy says he thinks his brothers exaggerated the punishment. The boy says there's nothing that's gone on at his house that he's concerned about. The video is over. Tori, Tori Stallings ended her questioning, and now Timothy Hennessy, lead attorney for Trizel West, is questioning her. Barton confirmed she conducted forensic interviews of all the boys. It was on December 28, 2020, that the eldest boy said he saw Orrin die. Prior to that, he didn't say that. Barton said she's aware the purpose of forensic interviews is to make sure the children tell the truth and are improperly influenced. Between December 22nd and 28th, Barton said she came to the conclusion the parents were lying after seeing the interview the parents gave to the news and interviewing the children for the first time. Now, this pause right there. So, again, this is the interview I was speaking of. And, again, you see this playing out, like, with this, you know, kind of line by line with the kids and whatnot of, like, no, well, the cold shower thing and the brother, other brother said this and nothing's really gone in the house that I didn't perceive and whatnot. And so this is where you have so much stuff muddying the water in this case, right? I'm like, oh, my God. It is so much to sort through. It's just as layered and complicated, but in a different way as, like, the David trial right because this is like everyone has this different thing going and at the center of it you have these parents and especially a lot seems to come back to Trizel his behavior his the way he ran that household that type thing and again I will say this under times well first of all think about this okay like when you're growing up and when you're young like this what you know is what you know and so if what you know is considered dysfunctional to society, it might not be to you because it's what you know, it's your norm. And so what I'm specifically referring to is this like cold shower thing, right? Where it's like, okay, was there this? Well, these boys said this. and Well, maybe it just needed to get warmed up and whatnot. Okay, so if there is a form of punishment of you've done something wrong, you have to take a cold shower. That's, I mean, I don't know. That's creative but it's really out there to me right um that's just getting into a whole level of i don't know right i mean that's just it's it's i i don't know what to say about that but if that's what you know then that's going to be your norm you know what i mean uh, sadly sadly i mean this is you know whatever and sometimes it can be 10 times worse right i mean we see this in these cases we follow so that's where i think it's so incredibly difficult with children involved in the picture and then when they're sitting there in the room with their parents you know i mean trizel and jack and all that i mean i i can't imagine um going through all this or especially when this was first popping off because remember they didn't get arrested right away so when they were sitting here like interviewing the children and whatnot and doing this and doing that in the very beginning i mean now it wasn't too long before the kids started being taken away Way, but nonetheless these kids were still under the same roof with them when this first popped off and that's you know 
I mean, that's stressful on anybody, but especially a child who's under their care. Okay, so moving on, it says Armstrong testified one video of the West Home on December 21st, 2020, shows lights in the background that in his opinion correspond with the motion of a car on the roadway. Armstrong said the video shows someone open the right door of the West Van, but you can't see who it is. You can see the door open, but you can't see the person because they are wearing dark clothing and there is very little reflective light. Stalin's asked about what Stalin asked, what about someone three feet tall wearing dark clothing? If you can't see them in the video, does that mean they're not on the video? No, Armstrong says, you can't say something isn't there just because you can't see it due to the contrast in the video. Now, again, this video that went around, I mean, y'all, it almost broke the internet, okay? I'm talking about, I mean, it was crazy, but this is, you know, one of the things that they're going to try and pull apart because this whole thing of the door opens and how many heads did we count getting out? And then at nighttime when he's going and looking around when this first happened and they, he circles the neighborhood with the thing, I mean, it is crazy. And at the end of the day, I, I mean, it's very difficult to tell because of the graininess and the contrast. And again, I would expect the defense on something like this to be like, well, you know, can you say they're not there if you can't see them? You know, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, I get it, right? Okay, so let me know what you think down in the comment section. If you've been following this, like day for day, that type of thing, you know, where do you think you're at? Do you think we're going to get a conviction for both Trezell and Jacqueline? What do you think of the evidence? Is there, some, you know, how do you feel about the children's testimony, their former testimony, do you think that they're being able to dismantle that? Do we think that there's truth in what they said originally? Uh, and it's not to say that I'm trying to accuse them of lying or anything like that, but I just think with the influence this has come in, it could have, you know, scared them and whatnot um, from telling the truth and, and that type thing. And then the conflicting testimony and all that kind of stuff. So I'm curious to know what do you think? Uh, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to continue following this um, and just see where it goes. And we're going to pray for justice for the boys because remember classic and sincere have never been found they seemingly disappeared into thin air allegedly according to Jacqueline and Trezell which they are not budging from the story on that evening where the story of going out to get the firewood you know and they just phew, vanished vanished into thin air and have never been seen again um I shudder to think what has happened to those poor little boys. Uh, and it's absolutely it's so undeserving and no way for anyone to have to leave this earth. Uh, so my heart goes out to them. Show love down in the comment sections for them. Uh, and that's it. I appreciate you being here. And next time we gather around our little, you know, electronical courtroom here, I'll see you there.